Hey everyone, ELD here, talking about my sideboard for Cephalid Breakfast. Now, as I started making this video, I actually started thinking about general sideboarding philosophy and also cards that I could have in my sideboard. And I think both of those should be different videos. So let me know in the comments which of those you'd like to see next. For now, let's talk about what I'm actually running, some of the utility of those cards, why I'm running them, and just the general ideas behind them. So Force of Negation up first. Really strong card, obviously, in a ton of sideboards. One thing that it really does for breakfast is it helps your keepable range kind of keep its teeth. Those turn one Nomad, turn two Cephalid hands, if they don't have any type of backup, are often not worth keeping versus the faster decks. I mean, saying I'm not going to do anything until turn two is a joke versus the Dark Ritual decks, you know, Reanimator Storm, uh, even something like a, a Chalice deck if they're on the play. I mean, that's just not, not looking good. You really want to be able to have that interaction and only having the win on turn two is potentially rubbish versus something that's going to kill you faster or lock you out faster. So force of negation, really great for that. The way I kind of think about it is game one, if your opponent has a turn one ad nauseum, if they're not just jamming ad nos without backup, they just shouldn't be playing ad nos. Now, yes, they will get countered sometimes, but the reality is the majority of the time it is going to resolve. Not like the crazy majority, it's not 90% to resolve, but like it's more than half, just jam, and you're probably going to win. And the higher the skill level, I think that gets more and more the case where it's like, you know, if you're playing against a, a literal child with a garbage deck, sure, take forever, whatever. They're not going to beat you unless something goes comically wrong, so drag the game out. Uh, but again, you're probably not choosing combo to beat up on children. So in general, if everything's equal and everybody's kind of relatively the same skill level, you need to take your percentage points where you can, and you're not going to be able to rely on being just head and shoulders better than people. Even if you're the best player in the room, you can't be that much better that you're just scoffing at a positive EV play. Now, what this does post-board is because you have two two of these plus four force negation, it takes that turn one, just jam and go for it and makes it into a negative situation for you. You're actually less likely to have it resolved because of the six pitch counters. So that's why I'm a big fan of this is post-board. It takes their greatest strength, which is the ability to just jam and force you to have it and say, yeah, no, I'm going to have it most of the time. So let me know if anyone has the actual math on that and we can pin that as well. Didn't expect to go on a whole offshoot talking about that, but here we are. We do these in one take as best we can. So Surgical Extraction and Fairy Macabre the next two. Now, this is from Losing to Graveyard Strategies. I've got four total copies, two and two. The split is because of Cabal Therapy. Those decks stripping out like three surgicals from your hand is just downright embarrassing. So I do like a mix. Uh, in terms of why Fairy Macabre is playable at all, it is better versus Exhum if we're talking about Reanimator as it'll hit two cards out of their graveyard. So if they have a Gristlebrand and an Archon, I mean, either one of those is probably good enough to beat you a good chunk of the time. So Fairy Macabre will actually get them both out of there and show up on the battlefield as a 2-2 as well, which is always hilarious. Uh, Surgical, of course, is great versus the graveyard strategies that also contain blue, as you can hit a Force of Will and see where their hand's at, possibly strip a counter out of their hand. And uh, just having perfect information is great when you're trying to combo off and win. If the window's there, you can just go for it after getting that perfect information. So graveyard strategy, I probably don't need four copies. I am currently on that. I think at this stage, I probably should cut back to like three copies and make some more room uh, as I have actually run into mono red prison lately and lost twice in the same tournament to it, which is a real rarity to me. That's a, a moment that totally justifies changing a sideboard. If I'm going to lose to a deck twice in the same tournament, I, I got to assume that that's actually a bad matchup if I was playing well. And the sideboard, that's what it's for, addressing bad matchups. So Prismatic Ending does help versus a deck like Mono Red Prison, but it helps versus pretty much any type of low mana value permanence. Originally, I was inspired to run this card because of Torpor Orb, actually the same pilot, uh, shout out to Matt Orfanello, helping push Cephalid forward here. Uh, he beat me with a Delver strategy that had Torpor Orb in the sideboard, and I was on a ridiculous win streak at that point. So I was like, oh, well, that's actually a card I want to answer, and this is an excellent answer to it, while also potentially just allowing for smooth gameplay of getting rid of Delvers or Deathrite Shaman. So it's not just this card, this what if they draw their bomb. It's like, all right, I can make the decisions accordingly. If I have a counterspell, I can go ahead and remove a Dragon Rage and just keep the gameplay going. 
And uh, if they do happen to draw like a plague engineer or some type of real problem permanent, prismatic ending can handle that as well. Of course, if you are answering creatures, nothing's better than swords to plowshares, particularly for breakfast. I mean, this deck doesn't care about your opponent's life total. They could start every game at a billion, and it probably wouldn't change uh, your win percentage very much. I mean, there are some grindy games where you slap people around with one ones, but I mean, that's not what we're setting out to do. Swords to plowshares, going to go ahead and exile any type of creature that we're worried about, and it's been doing it none better since Alpha. Three copies of that right now. Fairly happy with it. And then Mystical Dispute. This is the most recent uh, ink in change to the sideboard narsa and tafiri are legit issues for this deck they are powerful planeswalkers they are clunky to clear as you're not just like tapping them with a delver or some three power creature you're kind of chipping in there with you know one ones and stuff so it's not super easy to clear the planeswalkers compared to other decks that run creatures and counter magic so mystical dispute the best case keep them off the board that is preferable with both of them anyways as you want them to invest that three mana and not get anything out of it. That's really the best case scenario. And here, them investing three, you paying only one, and countering it, making sure they don't get to activate and draw a card off of it is, is really significant. So testing this out, Pyroblast is the type of card that I'd kind of want uh, in that spot, but we're, we're Esper and even Light on the Black. So Mystical Dispute, so far, so good. And I think that's probably going to be the best answer toward them i'm playing three copies right now when i'm testing outside board cards i do like to run three or four copies to actually draw them and kind of see how they are more often now it sounds like i was about to get into general sideboarding theory i will save that for another video and i hope you found this instructive i guess before i go i'll talk briefly about what cards i'm looking to cut so we've got orem's chance ball therapies dazes those are generally the cards that i'm kind of concerned about so for example versus the Control strategies, Days is a card that can easily come out for Mystical Dispute. They're not typically walking into Days, and as the game goes longer and longer, it becomes much worse. Orm's Chant versus many decks is pretty mid post board. If they don't have the counter magic and the tons of removal, uh, then you're potentially removing those. So if I was playing against a reanimator strategy, for example, uh, I'd be looking at bringing in the two force negations and the graveyard hate. That's six cards. Uh, chant isn't really strong versus them it's a nice reply to dark ritual but if it's not like a storm deck uh, orm's chance not really super exciting that is a brutal card to have four of in the main uh, when you're talking about storm strategies though i mean that's like being pre-boarded in that instance uh, so that's just a general breakdown sounds like i probably could do like a match by match kind of breakdown as well if people are super interested in that but thanks for watching and let me know in the comments what other type of breakfast content you guys are looking for.